Uh, let's just close our eyes in prayer. Father, we just come to your presence, Lord. <coughs> Lord, we just ask, God, that as we're going to be looking at your word, God, I pray that you open our ears, Lord, um, to hear your voice, God, to open our eyes, to really see Jesus for who he is. God, you open our hearts, God, to receive your word. God, if our hearts are softened, Lord, I pray that you, uh, sorry, if our hearts are hardened, God, you may, may you please soften it, Lord Jesus, Father. Um, Lord, uh, may you have mercy on us. Lord, pray for me, God, if there's any fear that I have, any pride that I have, any fleshy desires that I have, or any selfish desires, may you take it away, Lord, Father, God, Jesus, and you, may you fill me with your peace, God. May you fill me with your confidence and your boldness to share your word as it is, Lord. Um, God, even if it grieves us, let it be a godly grief that leads us to repentance, Lord. Um, we submit all this in your hands, God. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus', in Jesus name we pray. Amen. So, um, before I start my message, I would like, like to make an announcement. Um, today is Sean's and Johan's birthday. So, can we just celebrate them real quick? <laughs> Happy birthday, guys. Um, they love attention. So if you guys see him after church, please give them a hug and uh, wish them happy birthday. Love you guys. Um, <laughs> so my title of my message is Christ Our Advocate. And the passage we're going to be looking at is 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. So 1 John chapter 2 was 1 and 2. I'll be reading that in ESV. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So if we read this with no context, it's kind of hard to understand why John even started the chapter with that sentence, right? And to get a better understanding, we kind of have to look at the verses prior to that. Um, so we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 10 of chapter 1 real quick, and then we'll get to the main passage. And 5 through 10 goes like this. This is the message we have heard from, from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So in verse 7 of that chapter, there's two things that are happening if we decide to walk in the light, right? In school, when we had to like write a hypothesis, um, it, is often, like, it was often written using the words if and then, right? So for example, if I say, if I do not study, then I'll fail the test. So in a similar way, John here is doing the same thing. He's saying that if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So there's two things that are happening. It's fellowship with one another, or kononia, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And if we look at that tense of the word cleanse, it's actually a present tense, which is pretty interesting because John here is saying that even now God is cleansing and purifying us. And just like one of the purposes of a light is to see the surroundings, the more you walk and abide in Christ, you are made aware of your sin. And then if we look at verse 8, John is saying that if we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves. And then not only do we deceive ourselves, uh, but, his, but the truth is not in us. And what's that truth? It's his word. And then the word have in that verse is also present tense. So even now, there is sin that remains in every Christian's life. And then there's another word that stands out in that word, uh, in that verse. It's the word we. And John here is including himself in this and saying that he still has some sin in him. 
And some scholars say it, um, John was, isn't, was in his 70s or 80s when he's writing this, but he doesn't exclude himself out of it, right? So let's not just assume just because we reach a certain age doesn't mean we don't, just be, uh, doesn't mean we graduate from sin. So after reading, and then when you read uh, verse 9 and 10, it says, like, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then verse 10, it says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So after reading uh, verses 7 through 10, you might think it's okay to sin because grace will abound more, right? That was one of the worries John had too. He didn't want his readers to twist the meaning of it and think it's okay to sin. Even Paul went through that similar situation when he was writing Romans, right? Someone asked him in chapter six of uh, Romans that what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul responds by saying, by no means. So John, in that same way, is starting off chapter two by saying, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So there are two reasons why we shouldn't sin, right? One of them is we have to think about the cost, right? We have to think what Jesus did for us, right? The price he had to pay for our sins. And the second reason for us to not sin is because it grieves him. Like Isaiah, when he sees Jesus seated on the throne in Isaiah chapter 6, he cries, he cries out, woe is me, right? It means to have great sorrow or extremely sad. And so do we have that sorrow or sadness when we sin against him? When you really love someone, and it doesn't have to be like in a relationship setting or like marriage or something, it could be with friends too. The last thing you want to do is hurt them. When, when you see them hurt, it breaks your heart, right? So if you don't feel that way with God, like really examine and ask yourself why you don't feel that way, right? But then in that verse, he doesn't, he doesn't end the verse there, uh, verse there. John adds by saying that if anyone does sin, we have this advocate right now with the Father. And then the advocate is none other than Jesus Christ the righteous, and so what is the meaning of an advocate? So if you look at Google, it says a person who publicly supports or recommends a particular cause or policy. And it's, I think it's really easy to see Jesus as your advocate when everything is going right in this world. Um, it's really easy to see Jesus publicly supporting you when, like, again, everything is going right and there's no struggle or anything, but... That's not what John is saying, right? Like he's telling us to see, he's telling us to see Jesus as your advocate, especially when you sin. Because that's what he says. He says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. So like, do we really believe Jesus as our advocate when we sin? Like, because for me, that is the last thing I think about. Sometimes we think God can't stand us and wants nothing to do with us when we sin. Like, how can Jesus be an advocate for me in that time when I sin? How can God, who is holy and just, have his son be an advocate for a sinner like all of us? And the reason is because of verse 2. And the verse 2 says, He is our propitiation of our sins but not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So what does the, world, uh, what does the word propitiation mean other than it being really hard to pronounce? It means to appease or satisfy. And satisfy what? Satisfy God's wrath. In this context, it means a sacrifice that bears God's wrath and turns it into favor. And due to the lack of time, it will be hard to go fully in depth about the term propitiation. But Pastor John Regis, like did a message about this two or three years ago, and he does a really good job explaining it. So I re highly recommend you guys go back and watch it because he talks about the difference between expiation and propitiation. But then let's be honest, like a lot of times when we think about Jesus dying on the cross, we only think about Jesus wiping away our sins. I and mean, that's not the full picture. 
Not only did he wipe away our sins, but he also took the full and justly wrath of God that we deserved. In the cross of Christ, God has shown himself to be just, which means utterly holy, so that a penalty demanded is not removed, but paid for by Christ, but also a justifier, which means the one who provides the means of justification and who declares people to be right standing with himself. Here is the heart of Christian faith, for at the cross you see like God's justice and God's love meet with no, uh, without compromising each other. And then when we read the Gospels, we see Jesus being rejected by his own creation, right? Not just any creation, but it's the same creation where Jesus, sorry, where God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit in Genesis 1 come together and say, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. He was beaten, he was mocked, he was spat on, people pulled out his beard. You know how, how much pain you have to bear for your beard to be pulled out? But even before all of that, at the Garden of Gethsemane, you see Jesus praying and interceding for all of us. And he's praying, and then you see his sweat drops turned into blood. Like, can we just imagine how much amount of stress a person has to go through for his sweat drops to be turned into blood? And then when Jesus was whipped, it wasn't just any whip, right? It was a wooden handle that was attached to these leather straps, and end of these leather straps were bone pieces and metal balls. So when you're whipped with that, it would get stuck on your back, and then the soldiers would pull it out. And his back was completely ripped. And not only that, they put the crown of thorns on his head, right? And at the, at the cross, you see, him, you see him being nailed. And then when they lifted the cross, the only, for, only way for him to be hanging on or even just have support on the cross was the nails, right? And in that moment, the very first thing he says is, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Even in that moment of severe and gruesome pain, Jesus is interceding for, for them and even us. And then that, that's not all what happens, right? There's one more thing that happens in that story. And it was when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In some sense, Jesus had to be cut off from the favor and fellowship of the Father because he was bearing our sins and enduring, our, enduring God's wrath. Like, can we just really, like, just imagine and picture that? Like, Jesus, who was before the foundations of the world, has eternally been in a relationship and fellowship with the Father, but at that moment, he felt his, like God the Father had abandoned or forsaken him. And we have to really ask ourselves, like, why? Like, why did he have to go through all of that? Right? And so let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And worship team, you guys can come up. So 2 Corinthians says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become righteousness of God. So it was for our sake God made Jesus, so God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become righteousness of God. So God the Father didn't force himself, God the Father didn't force Jesus to die for us, but Jesus willingly did that for us. That the same way they, in Genesis 1, they come together and say, let us make man. This time they're coming together and say, let us save man. Because, all because God loves us so much. So like, let's go back and really think about Jesus being our advocate. When your sin is making you feel guilty, and you think about you're not worthy, Jesus is publicly saying, he or she is mine. I paid the price for them, and they are my son and my daughter. 
Like really picture that. Like if you're feeling guilty and just imagine Jesus saying your name, saying that I paid the price for Faba, I paid the price for Zach and Hubby, that they are my sons and my daughters. God is not shocked by his sins. He knows you're gonna stumble. He knows you're gonna fall. And that's why Jesus is your advocate. And that's why he's my advocate too, right? He under, Jesus understands and empathizes with us. In Hebrews chapter 2, uh, two verse 18, it goes like this. For, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. I just want to say that again. For he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. So 2023 is a new year, right? but it's also gonna be a long year for all of us. We are gonna fall, we're gonna stumble, we're gonna make mistakes, but let's find rest knowing that we have this advocate, like the advocate right now, who is with the Father, and he is, his name is Jesus Christ. May his name be glorified.